Hello, folks. Brandon Chapman with you today. It's another edition of the Monday video for Theo Trade. It's uh, September 23rd, uh, 2024. Uh, I titled today's session Muted Monday Malevolence. Muted, hey, you know, the SB is only up a quarter percent. We're set to close here in about 25 minutes. Uh, malevolence, why? <laughs> well, uh, we're talking about a potential angry reaction. Uh, to what we're currently seeing in the broader market right now. So that's why the malevolence, malevolence title uh, is there. Well, how do I know that? Well, just look at the VIX. I mean, right now the VIX is getting not smashed. They were down a little bit on the VIX. Um, we look at SKU. I mean, SKU is coming off record levels at above 170. We've ticked back on Friday to 165. Uh, we may see this rise today. The point being is that what are we setting up for here? I mean, when you look at SKU... We're north of 130, which is extreme. We're at a coming off a record high last Thursday. What is this setting up for? It's setting up for a potential big move lower. We're talking about the tail risk of the market potentially being man manifest somewhat soon. And uh, and certainly with SKU, you have a higher incident of small updates. Well, if we go back to the S&P 500, isn't exactly what we're having today. So SKU points to higher frequency of small updates. But the long tail, the risk of the downside in terms of movement is preeminent. Friday was probably the, the highest level of crash risk we've ever experienced in terms of the S&P 500 as being priced into the options of the SPX as institutions look to hedge through calls and puts. In this case, buying puts, selling calls. And so as we look at this, we're kind of saying, hey, we got the grind. We got the Fed 50 last Wednesday. The Fed's cutting 50 basis points. And according to uh, the Fed uh, uh, Fed head, uh, Austin Goolsby, it's not all, right? This morning he's talking about on Bloomberg that, hey, lots of cuts are yet to come. He's talking about, oh, the real the real Fed funds rate. Okay, so let's look at, for example, dollar sign, sorry, we'll go T, sorry, IRX <laughs> uh, colon uh, CGI. We're looking at the three-month T-bill. This is a good approximation for what the Fed funds rate is. Uh, but look who we're at right now. We're down to 4.5%. The Fed funds rate got cut to 4.75% to 5%. Basically, we cut from 50 basis points from 5 and a quarter to 5 and a half down to 4 and 3 quarters to 5%. Look where T-bills are right now. Three-month T-bills are pricing at 4.5%. They're already pricing in the next rate cut. This is crazy, right? But that's exactly what Goolsby's signaling to the market. Let me just refresh this page, make sure it's uh, accurate here. But look, we're basically pricing in a 50-50 bet right now. The Fed is going to cut another 50 uh, in the next meeting in November. If we go out to December, how much are we expecting by the end of the year? We're expecting a 75% chance. Add this to that 76% probability. We're going to be at four and a four to four and a quarter or less. What does that mean? That means another 50 in November and another 25 in December or flip that around. 25 in November, 50 in December. Essentially, the Fed is signaling to the market, we don't care about inflation. We have super core inflation running 4.9% plus. And all of a sudden we're saying, hey, we're going to cut rates one and a quarter percent by the end of the year. A lot of cuts to come over the next year. They're not going to stop there, folks. And why? Why should they? Right? I mean, at the end of the day, there's four things going on here. Certainly politics, right? Jerome Powell is what? He's not going to be re-upped. His term is not going to be re-upped in a Trump administration. Trump's already made that known. His only hope is for Harris to reappoint him. Okay? And what does that mean? Hey, we got to be accommodative. We got to push as much as we can right now because it's serious. We want to show to the current administration uh, that we are we are behind them, right? In terms of policy, so we can remain in power. Okay, great. Or not so great if we're talking about inflation concerns. Um, also, what's another reason? Bank fragility, right? Banks right now, how good of shakes are they sitting in right now? Well, guess what? Because the Fed raised rates at historic levels, five out of five and a quarter, five and a half percent, the pace of increases were profound as well. This rating, this is the historic in terms of going from zero percent to five and a quarter to five and a half percent. There's significant amount of losses sitting on bank balance sheets. And on top of that, we're already having signs. Ally Bank, for example, saying, hey, uh, loan losses on cars uh, may be a problem. It hit, J hit JP Morgan. 
right now we're just thinking about the possibility of losses. We may be just around the corner between having real losses, not on treasury bonds, which are paper, but actual physical defaults based on the poor loan portfolio that some banks may have over others. And if we look at JP Morgan right now, JPM, uh, we'll flip this back to a, a one-year daily chart. They took it pretty hard a little over a week ago, back on the 10th, right? The losses at banks, not just unrealized losses due to treasuries, but losses in general may be starting to perk up. And that means what? We're in a recession. The Fed cutting one and a quarter percent in three over a course of three meetings. How often that has that ever happened? Austin Goolsby's trying to say, hey, well, you know what? I mean, inflation, projected 10-year inflation is, is maybe, I don't know, what is it, 3.6%? The 10-year Treasury yield, sorry, 2.6%. The, the 10-year Treasury yield is 37 He would say, we have restricted policy, restrictive policy. But what do we know inflation is going to be in 10 years, given these guys out there printing money ad infinitum, Re failing to reduce the size of their balance sheet and doing nothing to really curtail it, to curtail uh, inflation other than raising rates to five and a quarter to five and a half percent in record time. Now I say, okay, now we got to back it off quick. Why? Because you made a policy mistake because you didn't reduce the size of your balance sheet. You didn't quickly take down your bank, bank of bailout program or the reverse repo. We let this stuff go on for years and now we're just saying, okay, now we got to rip the Band-Aid off in terms of raising rates to five and a quarter, five and a half percent. And now we've got to, to try to prop up the banks. Meanwhile, we've created massive inflation in the market. Prices are going to come down, folks. They're going to battle to keep prices exactly where they're at. So if you're thinking inflation coming down means prices are going down, you would be wrong, right? We will never normalize current prices under this current regime that we're currently under right at the fed and the complicity of uh, of our elected representatives and how essentially the fed right now is married at the hip uh with with the uh with the governing body right versus beholden to the banks the banks are sitting back with losses wondering okay when is it going to reverse so in essence what we're saying is yeah they backed off a little bit in terms of short term rates but guess what happened long term rates treasury notes 10 year treasury notes yields have actually gone higher if this starts to roll over and starts to head lower, the Fed is going to even cut more quickly. They want to steepen the yield curve. They want to be able to have banks bar for lower rates and lend at higher rates, have greater margins, have greater net interest income to try to help them get back to maybe where they were pre-COVID, which wasn't great either, by the way. So we have all this stuff lingering out there. And Austin Feds Goolsby says, hey, a lot more rates are to come because, hey, we really res restricted policy too much. Now we got to get back. And this is precisely the type of signal that people have seen historically when you cut 50 basis points. It's in response to what? Likely recessionary pressures. And so we look into the market over here. We're trying to figure out. We're saying, okay, who's up today? Tesla's up 4%. Intel's up. Okay, maybe there's a deal. Maybe there's not. But major gap down. Right. And we're just looking at maybe some short covering down here. Next Terra is a utility stock. Yields have gone up, right? And yet Next Terra is bouncing today, 2.3%. Our, our utility is saying, I don't believe that yields are going to go higher. I think yields are going to go lower. And so it's a more attractive. I mean, FedEx took it on the nose. This is just a dead cap bounce today, right? Short covering. Boeing, my goodness, a little bit of spring today. But reality is, we're barely back to where we were early last week. Okay, this one makes sense. Government spending on defense. Okay, it seems like they tend to be very amenable to that. You can see RTX in here. And there's some other companies in here as well. We got Lockheed Martin LMT up 1.5%. This is something Blake outlined in our Friday video, uh, Theo Live, uh, in terms of looking at defense companies, defense contractors, right? Boeing's in the mix there as well. Okay, they're sucking from the teat of the federal government in terms of their spending and how much they want to blow up. And yet, okay, now Walmart's up one half percent. Why? Walmart's trading at a very extreme valuation. It's a consumer defensive stock. Why is it one and a half for one and four percent today? Altria, consumer defensive stock. Okay, major sell-off here. Maybe we're getting a, a little bid today. High volume reversal on Friday. Uh again, uh, um, a hammer type formation. We're getting that confirmation bid today. 
But look at the volume. Volumes are very unimpress unimpressive right now for the market generally today. Visa, a significant call activity today. Look, but again, we had very significant neutral candle, massive volume on Friday. Today, we're getting a nice bounce, but no volume behind it. We're just sitting back and watching. What is going to happen? How can we interpret what the Fed is doing? We couldn't interpret it when they went from zero to five and a quarter to five and a half percent. We certainly can't get, can't interpret it now if they're going back to ZERP, which of course a, a progressive like Austin Gulby would love to see, right? They want to see them pump significant money in the market, expand credit, expand, 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 inflation be damned, right? That's in essence what the Fed is saying right now. They don't care about it. They're going to pretend they've got it under control, which they haven't over the last few years. And they're just going to cut rates regardless. And the last point I'm going to make in terms of why they, in the incentives for them to cut, the fourth one, is the fact that they have massive losses. Okay? By cutting rates, by us going tipping into a recession, by the way, would actually benefit them greatly if we start to see a bid, we start to see buying in the treasury market, right? Long-term treasury, notes, bonds, et cetera. If we see this back up here from 4% to 3.9 and head back lower, go back to when they bought a bunch of stuff back here in 2020, yields are at 1%. Imagine the unrealized losses. In fact, they're losing, as I talked about on Friday during our Theo Live event, they're losing about five to $10 billion a month right now off of their, off of their treasuries. That is that the, they're not providing any remittances to the treasury. Their losses are five to 10 billion bordering more on 10 billion monthly at the moment. So again, if they cut rates, we start to see some recessionary pressures. Maybe that does cool off inflation. It doesn't necessarily bring prices down, but the rate of inflation starts to diminish. People go for, for uh, shelter, buying long-term treasury bonds, yields come down. And all of a sudden it makes their balance sheet look better. It makes their unrealized losses look better. And by the way, it also makes it cheaper for the federal government to borrow at this point in time, which they seem to be very keen on doing. All right, so we have all this stuff going on and the market's sitting back at this point in time and trying to figure it out. Uh, today, if you think about the inflation and pressures, Newmont Gold Stocks. Uh, Newmont's a company, they started to write a bunch of stuff off at the moment, um, which is trying to get through. They've done this in the past. So if I go back here, 10 year weekly, Back in, I believe, oh, no, I can't even see it there. It's been over, let's go 20 years monthly. Uh, back here, 13, 14, they wrote off a lot of bad assets, allow their stock to get some traction and head higher. It's exactly what we've seen. I talked about this a few months ago uh, as they started to price that in. Uh, Newmont's up strongly. We're at a 423% projection off the seed wave back here. And as we look at Newmont, today it's a 27 SEP. And uh, let me just come in here, 27 SEP. We're going to look at the uh, apply to the Okay, we're good. So 24,000 contracts traded, mostly bought at the 57 strike. So again, we're seeing some upward pressure right now on gold and gold stocks. Now, the only question is, if we start to see a turn where the market doesn't like, and that's the malevolence part of it, right? The idea is, if we start to get a little angry at what's going on right now, and prices start to fall, it's likely the dollar itself will gain strength and catch a bid that's going to put pressure across the entire complex. In that case, gold and gold stocks will likely sell. Gold, however, will typically outperform the S&P 500. Something I talked about a while ago, ICLN post-debate. Um, I've got to type in the right symbol here, I guess. Uh, ICLN is boost back here post-debate on the 11th. Uh, again, clean energy stocks. We got TAN. We've got fan. All these companies got a boost uh, post uh, post debate, um, and you know, look, we got uh, last week Neo, for example, in a flag formation. We had bullish option activity on Friday. Um, we had it also in uh, um, in uh, uh, XPEV as well, XPEV last Friday. Long call activity broke out. We're kind of testing this area. We're seeing that pick up again today as we look at Liato. Uh, Liato again, breaking out volume, uh, barely making it back to the last few days here. Again, volume today is not good. We're hitting a high. This is where we start to see maybe an inflection point. The downside, again, anger that may appear. Malevolence currently at the high here. But Liato today, uh, this was a December expiration, so it's out here a little ways. 
Uh, scroll down here, December, we're seeing out of the money calls being bought at the 25 strike. Uh, during my session, we talked about targets and potential movement and set up for maybe some vertical opportunities. Um, again, kind of dovetailing with the move we're seeing in Tesla today. Although these are Chinese stocks, that typically have some higher short interest as well that helps kind of fuel them. On the consumer credit side, though, the juxtaposition with DFS at resistance starting to roll over discovers holding on to these loans, similar to Ally, similar to American Express, similar to Capital One Financial. So we've held up relatively well, but today DFS rolling over at resistance, and we're seeing a November expiration step in on the put side um, at the 40 to 140 strike price. So again, we're looking at kind of a rolling over here in Discover, may have a chance to get back to like 131-ish or possibly rolling all the way back to 120. Uh, again, this is kind of a high point, maybe a reasonable point to look at a in-out spread in DFS. Macy's, we're looking at retail. I mean, how is the consumer right now? We're starting to see Macy's kind of turn over here at a resistance, at a lower high. Again, volumes have remained relatively light today for the most part. We kind of came off our lows slightly. But the option trade today is a 27 SEP expiration, very short dated. They're buying these uh, slightly out of the money calls, at the money calls, but puts rather at the 15 strike. So again, what are we expecting here? Probably at least a retest of prior lows at 14. This creates a reasonable point to look at a spread, a vertical spread, or maybe even buying a put with a $14 target and may end up going below that. On the flip side, though, we have uh, consumer defensive stocks like Altria. Altria saw some significant decline, right? We're one of the better performers in the S&P 100 today. We're catching a bid up 1.3%. Volume was extreme on Friday on a neutral candle. We're seeing that resolve today as the bears are getting exhausted. The bulls are stepping in, albeit on low volume today. But we may get a melt up here, 52, 53. But if we look at the option activity, this is for 4 October. So go out here two weeks, 11 days here. 6,000 contracts, mostly bought at the 52 strike. So again, what are we looking for here as far as a target's concern? Let's look at about a 50% retracement of 52 and a half, maybe 53 to the upside. This also might be a reasonable intermediate term trade as we're coming off our lows. Would have loved to have had higher volume today. We are seeing some volume behind the scenes in the options market that does help create some degree of gamma. Uh, another uh, utility stock today, Southern, right? Southern closing at a new high today. Again, volume's low. Came off a high volume reversal day on Friday, closing at a new high today, breaking out of this kind of flag pattern. Again, normally you'd like to see volume. You don't like to see volume increase at the tail end. Uh, but again, we have kind of a support level at around 90.16. And today there was an October expiration traded uh, on this uh, on, on, on Southern out here at the 92.50 strike price. So again, we're looking at 92.50 being the target. Hey, this would be a reasonable, hey, you know, buy the 90, sell the 92 call spread. Or the stock looking at again look at this rally back here 84 and a half to 90 we're talking about six points off the break we might be looking at closer to 96 as a as a, as a target near-term ex, uh, uh, expectation 92 plus but again the call activity helps create some gamma at that level we'll wrap it up with visa i mean heck visa likes higher prices as long as you're still buying but again look at friday's volume it's crazy right it was a significant option expiration. We saw, you know, decent amount of movement, but in reality, it was the volume, the tug of war that occurred on Friday. And we're seeing that the buyers are winning today. We exhausted the sellers. Near-term target, 293. But if you look at the option activity, it's out there in the 27 SEP expiration. So that's for this week. And we look at a very short dated 290 strike. We're almost at the money right now. But again, we're looking at near-term upside here, testing at least 295, maybe higher. And again, now we think about energy, and we'll kind of wrap it up here with energy, though. But uh, UNG, uh, despite the fact that uh, natural gas right now has some pretty big roll, the cost of rolling is about 10% from this one to that one. It's going to cause UNG to underperform. But if Nat Gas is about to make a big move here, today's up almost 5%. UN, sorry, forward slash NG is up 8%. So it's going to underperform because of the steeper term structure. But UNG is a possibility as a play, or you start to look at stocks that are that are what that are um, uh, not in range resources. RRC, sorry, RRC like a range resources like in Antero, right up five percent today. 
There's a number of these stocks with which you can look at that may participate with a rally in a, in a natural gas. So again, these are a number of names with which may tie in, or you can look at other producers that are making a move as we speak uh, in the natural gas space. Uh, um, you know, you got Tellurian. So we got a bunch of these stocks. Tellurian, for example. Uh, actually, that one's getting bought out. Forgot about that. Uh, CTRA, Cotera, um, a little bit more delayed in its in its breakout here. Chesapeake's leading the way for all intents and purposes. But Antero is kind of interesting because of today's move. We're near resistance. We're up nicely at five percent. Look for a breakout on volume. And this has about what about a, a, a four five four and a half dollar range off a of breakout. Thirty three and a half. We start to get close to the prior highs up here as a target in the, in the, in the short to intermediate term. Uh, we're out again. We'll look at, uh, um, again, you can go diversified in something like Exxon again, looking at uh, around a 122 and a half target. We do have resistance at 120, but again, there's a lot of rotation in the space that may help promote or help support energy and metals. Um, CCJ, maybe the three mile Island news, uh, opening up again, more, maybe more demand, uh, for, uh, for uranium. Had a nice breakout on uh, Friday. We're continuing that move today. And the trade in this one's a 47.51 uh, for October. So it's a long call vertical. So come here, October 47.51. So right here, 47.51, maybe rolling it out. So we're adding two rather to a prior. So again, we're looking at a lot of potential movement in energy generally. Metals, again, as well. We looked at Newmont. And again, some smattering of other companies right now that may have a chance to hold up. Again, you look at utilities, that may be in there as well with Southern breaking out. You got a next tier at the list, top of the list as well. Folks, we'll catch you back next week. You have a great one. Uh, we'll see.